Amen. Lots of fun stuff going on. So we're running a little bit behind, but we're going to make up for time. Amen. We are continuing our message on the violent gospel. We talked about um, that name, violent gospel, which it, it sounds a little funny because it's the violent good news. Um, but that's what it is, amen, and we've been explaining why it is what it is. And so last week we took a look at the spiritual warfare involved in the parable of the sower. And we just talked about how, how violent the parable of the sower is. The enemy is after the word, right? We pinpointed that he uses deception oftentimes to steal the word away from us. And he oftentimes uh, attacks the character of God in this deception and gets people to believe that God is somebody that he's not so that they can't even receive his word. We also talked about some people who have already received the word, but then troubles and persecution come and rob them of the word, steal the word away from them, because when trouble or persecution comes, they give up. Then we talked about another group who received the word, but then the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke out the word in their lives and so that it doesn't have any effect in, your, in their lives. They might be sitting in the seats, they might be Christians, they might be in church, but the word of God is of no use to them because of all of these things that have come against them to try to stop them and rob them of the rich blessings of God's word. And so that's what we talked about last week. I explained that in order for us to be producers in God's kingdom, and every single Christian is called to be a producer in God's kingdom. Amen? Okay, let me say that again. Every single Christian is called to be a producer. See, there's producers and there's consumers. Consumers just come and... Producers get up and do, amen? Producers produce, amen? 30, 60, 100 fold. Producers produce. Every single Christian is called to be a producer in God's kingdom. Say, I am called to be a producer in God's kingdom. That's right, you are. Today, we're continuing our series on the violent gospel by exploring the lives of Jesus' closest followers. And as we examine the lives of these men, I'm asking you to examine your own lives. Amen? What similarities do you see between how you're living compared to how they're living? And what can we learn through studying their lives? Trust me, we're not just going to learn good and amazing things. We're going to learn things from their mistakes as well. Isn't that good? Right? So let's start with the calling. Matthew 4, 18 to 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I just want us to notice real quickly here that Jesus didn't go to the top rabbinical schools to get his disciples. Amen? He didn't go to the top rabbinical schools to get his disciples. He didn't go to the educated. He went to the docks. He went to the blue collar, rough cut, uneducated. And that's where he drew from for his disciples. And the reason being is because he came on a mission. He was here to undo the works of the enemy. He didn't come to bring peace, the Bible says. He came to bring a sword. That sounds a little violent to me. And so what he came for was going to require some things. It was going to be difficult, uncomfortable, challenging, and downright violent. Jesus chose Peter, James, and John for this reason. Notice how it says they immediately left everything behind and followed Jesus. Look at John chapter 1, verse 41 and 42. We're talking about the calling. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, 
You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, which means rock. This was Jesus having a word of knowledge about Simon. He called him by name, told him who he was, and then gave him a nickname that mirrored his personality. How would you like to walk up to somebody and then look at you? You don't know them. You've never met them in your entire life, and they call you by name and tell you exactly who you are. Just like that woman at the well, Jesus told her everything that she had ever done in her life, right? And this is a similar experience that Peter had, Simon Peter had, and he changed his name, right? He came in Simon, he left out Peter. This was Jesus having a word of knowledge about Simon, The very first time he met Simon, again, he nicknamed him the rock as a way of saying, I already know who you are. I know you are hard, stubborn, and impetuous, but I'm calling you to follow me anyways. And just as Jesus knew Peter before they actually met, he knit you together in your mother's womb, and he knows everything about you as well. I don't know if you knew this, but did you know that Jesus already knew what a mess you were before he called you? (laughs) he already knew what a mess I was I know that and it didn't take much to see before he called me even though he knew everything about you he chose you and called you anyways God has a plan for your life and he's not finished yet can anybody say amen he's not finished yet Mark chapter 3 16 to 19 again the calling these are the 12 He appointed Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, or Rock, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon of the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So notice that Peter, James, and John were the only ones to receive nicknames in the whole group. That's interesting to me. James and John were nicknamed Sons of Thunder. So we have the rock and we have Sons of Thunder. Interesting, right? It speaks of their character. And yet I want to show you through the Scripture that these three men were the closest ones to Jesus. What does that say? What message does that send to us who are following Him? It seemed to be something that Jesus was looking for in his disciples. So the sons of thunder, why were they given this name? Well, if you ever met their mother, you might understand. Amen. I say this as a joke, but it's true. Their mother went to Jesus and said, Jesus, when you are glorified, I would like James to sit on one side of you and John to sit on the other when you sit on your throne. Yes, and so she was very forward and aggressive, just like her sons were, and they were sons of thunder. Amen. The other disciples didn't like that very much, by the way. They were a little upset about that. So, these sons of thunder were similar to Peter in that they were passionate, aggressive, and impulsive. Peter, James, and John, the rock and the sons of thunder, became the closest three people to walk with Jesus. And so we just went through the calling. Now let's talk about the connection. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And we can go on and talk about what Peter said and how he put his foot in his mouth and all that stuff. But right here, isn't it amazing that these three were privileged to experience the transfiguration when no other disciples went up that mountain? Can you imagine seeing uh, the glorified Elijah and Moses having a conversation there? I mean, would that not change your life? right? Experiencing that, and they were able to experience it with Jesus. Jesus separated these three men out and brought them with him everywhere that he went. Luke chapter 8, verses 51 to 56, 
when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. And then it says that they laughed him to scorn because they knew that she was dead. And he went in with his disciples and with the parents. Jesus went on to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. And these three men were eyewitnesses. They were in the same room when Jesus spoke to this little girl and commanded her to rise. Isn't that amazing? What would that have been like to be right in that room when Jesus spoke to her and she sat up? Can you imagine what her parents looked like in that moment when their daughter was given back to them? Even at the most difficult point in his life, Jesus kept these three men close. In Matthew 26, another example, verses 36 to 38, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. During his greatest time of need, Jesus called for Peter, James, and John to be by his side. And then did you hear what he said? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This was not the Jesus that they had walked with the past three years. The Jesus they had walked with the past three years was strong and unshakable. He was resolute. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. And he was a leader. And now they hear him saying, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. How do you think the disciples felt in that moment? When the man that they had left everything for and that had been such a strong leader is now showing signs that he's weighted down and sorrowful even to the point of death. They experienced that. They were with Jesus. They were by his side. We can see through these scripture passages that these disciples were his closest companions. And even though Jesus chose them as his inner circle, they still made all kinds of mistakes. To me, that's just a wonderful idea that the ones that were the closest to Jesus still screwed up on a regular basis. I mean, if you study the Scriptures out, they don't even have all their mistakes in there, I guarantee it. But there's enough to understand that these guys made some mistakes. And that makes me feel good because I make mistakes. These were the closest three. Let's look at a couple of the mistakes. Luke 9, 51 to 54. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is Jesus on his way to die for you and for me. And sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But the Samaritans, they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, that the Samaritans did not receive him, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? Interesting. Where was Jesus going? Jerusalem. Why was Jesus going there? To die on the cross. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Here he's going to Jerusalem to fulfill the mission that he has on this earth, to die on the cross, to shed his life's blood for all mankind, to forgive them of their sins, 
and give them an opportunity to partner with God and to step into the family of God and to have entrance into heaven for eternity. Jesus gave his life for you and for me. He gave his life for those Samaritans in that village. That was his mission. And here his closest disciples are saying, Lord, they offended us. They didn't receive you. They didn't give us lodging here. Would you like us to call fire down from heaven to consume them? And then they followed up with, you know, it's scriptural. (laughs) They said, like Elijah. And so they were using Old Testament scripture to let Jesus know that they were following the message, the word of God, the example that was given to them before. Have you ever quoted a scripture that wasn't just quite right? For your own purposes, to make you feel better. Uh huh. Uh oh. So Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem. He's going there to die for the sins of the world. This is his mission. His advance team goes into Samaria to find him lodging on the way to Jerusalem. They deny him, say, you can't have lodging. And they say, should we call down fire? The very people, right, that Jesus came to die for, they're, they're, they're contemplating calling fire down from heaven to consume. This reveals that aggressive nature that the sons of thunder had, right? And let me just tell you something right here, that um, we all have different aspects of who we are and our personalities and different things like that. And I believe that God has gifted us with certain things on the inside of us. I understand that there's a, that there's a sinful nature, but I believe that God has gifted us with certain things on the inside of us. And when we aren't aware of the giftings and the, and the mission of God, we will take and use those things for worldly purposes, right? And so it's possible to use those things for worldly purposes. Anybody that knows children knows how that goes because your child might give you fits in certain areas and in certain ways, but it might be that exact nature that they have in that fit that they're throwing. And the reason they're throwing that fit, there might be a strength in there someplace. There might be something in there that they need when they get out in the world on their own. And so we need to identify what that is in our children and we need to develop that and harness that for God's plans and God's purposes. Amen? And the same is true. This aggressive nature that you see in these men, and the reason why Jesus called them is because there was a gift in it. There was a purpose in it. That they had to have what they had in order to accomplish the mission that Jesus had for them. And so even though we see it being used here in a wrong way, there is a right way to use it for God's glory. Amen? Listen to how Jesus responds to James and John in the next verse. Luke 9, 55 and 56. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Wow, when Jesus tells them that they don't know what manner of spirit they are operating in, we need to take note of that. They were operating in the wrong spirit. Yeah, anybody ever guilty of operating in the wrong spirit? The Holy Spirit lets us know pretty quickly if we're listening. They were operating in the wrong spirit. The spirit that they were operating in was quick to bring death and destruction instead of life. So what spirit were they operating in? Let me just ask you a question. Who's come to rob, kill, and destroy? The devil has come to rob, kill, and destroy. Who has come to give us life and that more abundant? Jesus has come to give us life and that more abundant. Amen? And so, which spirit were they operating in? They were operating in a spirit of antichrist. Well, that's pretty strong, antichrist. And we're going to talk about that some more. We might just have a whole message on that. But anti means opposed to or against, right? Right? So they were opposed to or against Jesus. They were opposed to or against his plans. They were opposed to or against his heart. They were opposed to or against what he desired. 
And when he, they are opposed to or against it, then they were anti-Christ. They were in the wrong spirit. Anytime we think, speak, or act in a way that is opposite or opposed to that of Jesus Christ, we are operating in an anti-Christ spirit that's opposed to Jesus and his plans and purposes in the earth. Do you see why it's so important, like we talked about last week, to know God's word? We have to know God's word. If we don't know God's word, we won't know God's heart. If we don't know God's heart, we will constantly be operating in this wrong spirit. Jesus was going to the cross to die so that these people could be set free. While James and John were wanting to call fire down from heaven to consume them. There is a huge difference in that. And I hope that you see that this morning. I hope that you see that this morning. I hope that you remember this when your neighbor is playing music too loud. I hope you remember this when your boss says something nasty to you. I hope you remember this when somebody does something that's not very nice to you. They weren't very nice to Jesus and his disciples there. They pushed them out. They said, we don't have room for you. We don't want you here. But he didn't curse them because he loved them. And we're to follow in his footsteps. We shouldn't talk nasty about people. We shouldn't be mean to people. We shouldn't shut people out. We need to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're Christ followers. Another mistake, Matthew 16, 21 to 25. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Here he is again, going to Jerusalem. And suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Verse 22. Peter, rock, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Never. Never. Wow. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So we need to keep some things in mind here. First of all, we need to understand that the disciples, not just Peter, but I'm guessing all of the disciples, they had read the Old Testament. They knew the prophetic, the, the prophetic words about the Messiah that was to come. And they knew that the Messiah that was to come was going to set up his throne and he was going to reign. And they all thought that that was now. When they started following Jesus, they thought, okay, the Romans, they're going to get a beating. And we're going to push the Romans out of our land. And Christ is going to establish his throne right here in our land. And we're going to have freedom from the oppressors. That's what they were thinking. That's what they thought this mission was that they were on. And so when Peter said, no, Lord, you can't do it. That's what he was thinking. He was thinking about a plan that was going to benefit him and his friends, and his family. And when Jesus started to veer from that plan and say things that were contrary to that plan, Peter grabbed a hold of him and shook him. I don't know if he shook him. I don't know if he grabbed a hold of him. But he did say to him, No, Lord, never. This shall never happen to you. What was Peter doing? He was stepping in between Jesus and the mission that Jesus had. Really, he was stepping in between Jesus and you and me. Because Jesus came to die for us on the cross at Calvary. And when he stepped in, when Peter stepped in between Jesus and his mission, Jesus rebuked him. Jesus turns to Peter again and says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus calls one of his closest followers Satan. Boy, that'd be a tough one to rebound from, huh? Think about that one. Your teacher, your, your pastor calls you Satan. Well, 
That's a tough one. I don't know. I think most of you would be looking for a new church about now. <laughs> right? But he didn't. Obviously, Jesus was not talking to Peter in this moment, but to the one who was influencing Peter. Amen? He called him by name, Satan. Here again, one of Jesus' closest followers was being accused of operating in an antichrist spirit. And isn't it good to know that Jesus' closest disciples made some pretty big mistakes? Huh? None of them were disqualified from walking with Jesus as a result of their mistakes. Yeah, let me just say this one more time, okay? None of them were disqualified from walking with Jesus as a result of their mistakes. And somebody needs to hear that today. Whatever that thing is that the devil has been using against you, telling you that you're not good enough, telling you that you're not worthy, telling you that there's something in your past that has disqualified you from following him. That is a lie from hell. It is a lie from hell. And God wants you to see that lie for what it is so that you can be free today. Amen? See, it feels like a weight that comes down on you. And it feels like something that hinders you from going further with God because you've just made this one mistake and you just went too far and, and, and you can get this far with God but you can't go any further because of this mistake that you've made in your past and that is simply not true. You need to let it go, give it to God and allow that weight to lift off your shoulders so that you can run this race that he has set before you with perseverance. You know when it says, right, to run the race with perseverance set before you? to throw off everything that hinders you and that sin that so easily entangles you and run this race with perseverance that God has set before you, the enemy is just piling, piling, piling lies upon you, lies upon you, lies upon you, lies upon you. Why? To weight you down so that you can't run your race. That's a devil from hell. And it's there. There's something there. There's something on the inside that's been holding you back. And maybe you don't even know what it is, but there's these thoughts of your past, these thoughts of things that you've done, these thoughts of being disqualified that are keeping you in bondage so that you can't run this race with perseverance. The Bible says, throw off everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles you and run your race. Run it to win, not just to run it, run it to win. Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of your faith. We're supposed to keep our eyes on him as we run this race. You are not disqualified. That is a lie. God is calling you to step up and to run this race. As God was calling Laurie and me to start Transformation Church, I asked the Lord a question. Lord, what if I screw up? What if I make a mistake? Some of you have heard this before. Immediately, God impressed upon my heart these words. Scott, I care about your success more than you do. And if you screw up, I will take your mistakes and turn them into masterpieces. I didn't even know that was legal. How can he take my mistakes and turn them into masterpieces? But that's the God that we serve, right? That's the God that we serve, right? For those who love him and have been called according to his prayer, he works everything out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The enemy cannot win. If you just stay in agreement with God, the enemy cannot beat you. Every weapon and every arsenal that the enemy brings against you, God takes it, turns it around, and uses it to bless you and to, and to purport you, to push you forward in the plans that he has for you. How can somebody beat you? As long as you stay in agreement with God and with what God's doing in and through your life, as long as you align your life with his plans and purposes and go after him, nothing can stop you because everything that is thrown at you. It's like the stumbling blocks that are thrown at you become stepping stones, and you just keep going higher and higher and higher and higher in the things that 
God has called you to. Man, thrust. Here, here's another one. Throw this. Bam, bam. It just gets you higher. It just takes you higher in the things that God has planned for your life. Can you imagine the enemy fighting against you and God blessing you and just bringing you higher every time, bringing you higher, and everything he throws at you, you just go higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher. How would you like to fight against an enemy like that? That they have someone working for them, and you can't beat them. Everything you do, they just get better. They just get stronger. They just get more blessed. That's you. You. Because God loves you, and because you're walking out the plans and purposes that he has for you. D.L. Moody, if God be your partner, make your plans big. Cling to God. Trust Him. Run after Him. And He'll turn your mistakes into masterpieces. See, as I heard these words, genuine joy replaced all fear, and I was totally freed up to run full speed after God. Did you know, this is like we talked about with that race, piling on you, piling on you, piling on you. What's He trying to get you to do? Slow you down and stop you from running that race. And as I heard those words speak to me, because I was afraid of making mistakes, I was afraid, what if I make mistakes? Man, I just screw up. How, how's that going to happen? And so I was bound by the fear of failure. And I wasn't moving forward in the plans that God had for me because I was bound in a fear of failure. And God set me free. And God wants you to know not to be afraid to make mistakes because he already knows before you make them that you're going to make them and he already has a plan to get you out of them and to help you and to bless you. Now you have to be repentant. You have to come before him and ask for forgiveness. Yes, I understand that. You have to love him and love the plan that he has for your life. Yes, I understand that. But God will bless you as you humble yourself before him. He will lift you up. There's not one mistake that you ever committed in your entire life that disqualifies you from walking with God in amazing ways. Not one. He paid for them all, and they were washed away with his blood. The fear of failure was attempting to hold me back from stepping out in faith into the plans that God had for me. Then God spoke truth and set me free. So what's holding you back from all that God is calling you to do in this life? Today, God is calling you to abandon everything holding you back and trust Him fully as you take this next step. You're going to have to read God's power and glory. It's wonderful. It's amazing. It's really good. Those scripture under there. Take your bulletin back and read those over. We talked about the calling. We talked about the connection. We talked about the mistakes that they made. I just want to hit one verse that's under God's power and God's glory. Go to, let me see. Hmm. Wow, there's so much there. It's good stuff. Let's go to Acts. Mm. Dang. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share them all, sorry. Acts 2, 40 to 42. Acts 2, 40 to 42 says, with many other words. So this was when, uh, right, this is when, um, the, this was the day of Pentecost, right? And um, they just got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And it says they stumbled and bumbled out onto the streets of Jerusalem, right? And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they were speaking in other tongues, right? As the Spirit gave them utterance. And um, some people saw them, right? And um, it was an interesting thing. It says with many other, so, so some people saw them and people thought that they were drunk, Thought they were drunk. I mean, that's so they were stumbling and bumbling. I mean, they were speaking things that didn't make sense, and they were walking funny. Why? That's the Holy Spirit upon their lives, right? And so they were filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And an amazing thing happened. A miracle happened because as they were out there, right, there were some people that, that, that thought they were drunk. But they weren't drunk. And then it says that because it was, the, it was the time of the feast, that there were people there from all different countries. And so this person was from one country. This person was from another country. This person was from another country. They all spoke different languages. But when they heard them speaking in tongues, they heard them praising the Lord in all of their separate languages at the same time. That's a miracle. 
And some of them did think they were drunk and said, those guys are drunk. And Peter said, no, it's just nine in the morning. Peter rose up. Why? There's boldness on the inside of him. There was that aggression, that boldness that God wanted to use right in this moment, right? There's a, there's a Kairos moment. God wanted to use him right in this moment. And he had to be bold. He had to be aggressive. He had to go after it. He couldn't just sit back and say, oh, what do they think of me? Oh, maybe they'll stone us. Maybe they'll do this. Maybe they'll arrest us. Oh, no, I just can't do it. No, he can't be like that. He couldn't be like that. He needed that aggression. He needed that boldness to do what God was calling him to do, to step up into a crowd full of people that didn't know the Lord and begin to preach the message. He said, no, no, that's not what this is. These are not drunk, seeing that it's only nine in the morning. They're just very, very filled with the Holy Ghost. And this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he went on to say how they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and they'd have dreams, and they'd prophesy. They'd see visions. They'd do all these things. He said, this is the last days. And he preached Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He preached repentance. He preached the forgiveness of sins. And what's it say? Look at this. In Acts 2, 40 and 42, with many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. 3,000 because of the Holy Spirit boldness allowed to be let loose in the streets of Jerusalem. 3,000 were saved that day. I said 3,000 were saved that day. <laughs> Holy Ghost boldness brought forth eternal fruit. No politically correct, careful not to offend, compromised Christian is going to have the boldness to preach a message to a culturally controlled crowd on the busy streets of a bustling city and see thousands of people come to Christ. You're not going to bring your politically correct, careful not to offend, compromised message and, and, and think that you're going to have any power or effect on the people's lives, right? you got to come and you got to preach truth, amen? you got to preach it bold, amen? Because if they don't see boldness, they're not going to believe it any more than you do. And it's boldness that tells them that you believe what you're preaching. And when they see that you're bold and confident, they're going to say, there's something about this. That's that Holy Spirit moving and working in and through you. This is what the world needs today. Two chapters later, the disciples healed a lame man and were arrested for preaching in Jesus' name. When they brought them before the ruling council, they preached a powerful message to the ruling council right in the middle of it. The ruling council made an interesting observation in Acts 4.13. This is what they said. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yes! This was the difference. These men had been with Jesus. These men had been with, they took note. They were unschooled, ordinary men, but listen to them. Oh, my, listen to them. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. And when you share with Holy Ghost boldness, they will take note that you've been with Jesus. And this is what we're called to do. Transformation takes place in our lives when we spend time with Jesus. We begin to operate and live in a way that is beyond our own ability. When we learn to put our trust completely in Him and step out in holy boldness, Christ is our confidence. We are bold because of Him, not because of us. We're bold because of Him. After they were released and went back and told the others all that had taken place, they began to pray together. What do you think they prayed? What do you think they pray? They just got arrested. They were beaten. They were let go. What do you think they're praying for? Well, listen to this. Acts 4, 29 to 31. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And it says in verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly, 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 boldly. 
They spoke it boldly, not timidly, boldly. It's time that we begin to speak the Word of God boldly to our family, boldly to our neighbors, boldly to our co-workers, boldly to our classmates, boldly, not wimpy, not timidly, boldly. Get filled with the Holy Spirit and let Him flow through you to do what it's impossible for you to do without Him. Hallelujah. They didn't say, consider their threats and protect us, O Lord. No, they didn't. They prayed for boldness. The Holy Spirit boldness is the secret ingredient that keeps on sending the life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Who is going to be used by God to advance His kingdom? Who's going to be used by God to advance His kingdom? Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. To make a difference in this world, we need to pray for and live in Holy Spirit boldness. The world desperately needs the church to arise and to preach the truth of God's Word in the power of the Holy Spirit. So are you growing in the Holy Spirit boldness necessary to empower you to reach the world around you with the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you growing in that Holy Spirit boldness? It's time for us to take the next step in our relationship with Jesus Christ and give ourselves fully to His plan of saving the world. That is His plan, right? That is His plan to save the world. And it starts right in your backyard. It starts right in your realm of influence. Maybe you're listening today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of your sins. You're hearing my voice right now because God has positioned you to hear this good news. That although you've made mistakes, that although you've sinned against Him, that although your life is completely contrary to the very purpose for Him creating you, He is here right now to forgive you. He is here to receive you if you'll just reach out to Him. If you've never prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, if you've never taken that step, again, you can hear my voice right now. Whether you're here in this room or listening online, you can hear my voice right now because God has positioned you to hear His good news and He wants you to reach out and receive this free gift of salvation that comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. He wants to give you forgiveness today. Wash all your sins away so that you can spend eternity with Him. But even more than that, so that you can have purpose on this life, in this life, and that you can carry out the plans and purposes that God has for you here. Heaven doesn't start when you get to some other location. Heaven starts now. Eternal life starts now. The plan that God has for you starts now. If you've never taken this step, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to pray with me right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed and every heart searching and listening to what the Lord is saying. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life completely to you. I pray that you would forgive me of all of my sins and that you would come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Lord, help me to live for you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God did exactly what you just asked Him to do. Your eternal destination just changed from that of hell to that of heaven with Him forever. And like I said, it starts right now, and there are some questions that you're going to have about this decision that you made and the commitment that you just made. And we just want to put a book in your hands, whether you're here in this room or listening online. 
This is a free book that we want to put in your hands called Now What? And it's just going to explain to you the step that you just took and what steps come after it. You see, this was just the beginning of your relationship with the Lord. It's not a magic prayer that just gets you into heaven. It's the beginning of a beautiful relationship that God wants to have with you. And so once you pray that prayer, now it's your responsibility to take these next steps. And this is going to help you to do that. So I encourage you, if you're in this room, grab one of these right through this door on that countertop all the way to the right. If you're listening online, we want to get this out to you as well. Just put free book down in the comments section, and we'll send one of these out to you and believe it will be a blessing to you. As the ministry team comes forward this morning, I have a question for you. Is there anything hindering you from going after God with everything that you have? It could be something that you need to change, or it might be something beyond your control. Whatever it is in your life that you're battling this morning, we would like to invite you to come up front, and we would like to pray with you. We believe that God is going to give you breakthrough today. Amen. So let's stand and worship together. And then Pastor Tim is going to close us.